Hi everyone, this is Shauna Terosa, Rayx Executive Officer, and this is my desk. In this monthly video cast, we go over questions that are coming across my desk every single day so we can have much smoother real estate transactions here in York and Adams counties. And viewers of this video blog often hear me say I'm not an attorney and I don't play one on TV, but with us today to answer some very important questions is our real life attorney. Peter Ruth with Stock and Leader and Rayax Solicitor is here with us and we have an important topic to address. So we Peter, do. welcome to my desk. Thank you for having me. Happy Always to be back. Glad. Always a great guest speaker. So we are going to talk about the confusion surrounding the bright MLS changes to their compensation rule. So in August of 2023, bright MLS changed their compensation policy ever so slightly. Before August of 2023, Bright MLS subscribers had to put in at least one cent of buyer's cooperative compensation from the listing agent. So you can put in any amount that you wanted, but it had to be a minimum of one cent. In August, the Bright Board of Directors decided to change this policy to allow for zero compensation to the buyer's agent being offered from the listing broker. So while this is a very small change because one cent to zero dollars is obviously nominal when it comes to changes in the actual fee that you're um, potentially offering to another Bright MLS subscriber, it has caused some confusions and questions in the marketplace. So we wanted to bring in our solicitor to help us address those questions and answer anything that we've been hearing come across our desk. So Peter, this policy came as a little bit of a surprise to some of our members. So can you help provide some background on cooperative compensation. I sure can. So I kind of, and we just put out an article as well on this. So if anybody um, is more of a visual learner, feel free to check that out as well. But I kind of start off this whole conversation with trying to remember three things. So offer, um, offering any cooperating compensation um, is not required. So we all know that now the bright policy has been reflected. It actually has never been required. Um, and there is no standard practice when it comes to that or industry-wide standard or regional standard. That's the second item. So um, no county-wide standard in terms of how any type of listing agent is going to share cooperation uh, and compensation with a cooperating broker or if they're going to share it at all. Uh, and I think the third thing and really the most important that I want all of the viewers to understand today discussing these items okay in certain ways can be violations of antitrust law i'll throw out a hypothetical okay if if an agent uh puts up uh, a screenshot let's say of the offer of cooperating compensation and it's five dollars and they go to social media and they display that screenshot with a, a, a heading that says why would anyone want to show this house okay be very careful because what you're doing um, is you may be potentially trying to skew what homes you're going to show your potential client as well as um, commenting on some type of, of standard practice or something along those lines that can get to violations of antitrust. So those are the three things. Offering it, offering it has never been required and it's not required now. We know that. Um, be on the lookout. There's no standard practice. So don't be discussing that with your clients because if you do, the major concern is that could be an antitrust violation. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. So why? Why this moment in time? Any insight into why Bright chose to make this policy change this year? Yeah, good question. So, and I should have started off this way. I don't, I'm not involved with Bright. I don't represent them. I don't provide legal counsel. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I wish we could provide more of a, a direct dialogue uh, in terms of some of those items. But at the end mm -hmm. of the day, what is happening is um, likely a legal influence. So everybody should be aware um, there have been lawsuits that have been filed against the National Association of Realtors as well as four brokerages. And what they are arguing, um, one of the cases is originating in Illinois and the other one is in Missouri. Um, so these cases are essentially have plaintiffs that are alleging the practice of cooperating compensation and sharing that um, is violative of antitrust laws and is really not in the best interest of a seller. And they're claiming that this practice has really inflated what buyer agents are receiving. They're placing a burden on a seller to compensate an agent who's not in, at a brokerage who may not even be involved with that seller at all. Uh, and 
and really they're trying to narrow it down. Is this some type of price fixing that's going on? Are NAR's policies as they relate to cooperating compensation, do they violate some type of price fixing? So um, as with all court cases, these things move relatively slowly. Uh, the Missouri case actually is scheduled for trial here, I believe coming up next month, um, whereas the Illinois case is taking a little bit longer to work it through. Uh, so that is, I assume, why that change has come about. As I said before, nothing is really new other than the change to the policy that something has to be offered. Um, so I think the, another thing to underscore is that NAR and Bright um, really champion themselves, I think, on providing pro-competition, pro-consumer information and providing a service that way. Um, and I don't think that has changed in what, the, in, in what they're doing. Um, it's all about exposure on the free market and really, mm -hmm. uh, I think, accurately and openly discussing how compensation is going to play out between a buyer and between a seller um, and, and the listing agent and the buying agent and how, how that relationship is really formed. So that's kind of the crux. Uh, but as I said before, I'm not really involved in, in the policy decision, but if I had to take a guess, that's probably. Yeah. And I think it's important to point out, as you said, NAR's policies are very pro-consumer, um, making sure that they are encouraging cooperation. And NAR is vigorously defending That's these correct. lawsuits yes. Good point. Um, that are going on um, throughout our industry right now. And hopefully we'll have some resolution in the near future. So back to this topic, what should buyer agents be doing in order to educate their clients about how they're getting compensated as a buyer's agent? Sure. And that's, uh, you know, I always speak in these hypotheticals as we always do, mm -hmm. but um, it, a great situation comes in and you're, you have to expect this, right? When a, when a buyer uh, comes in and they say, well, you know, I'm new to this process. How do you get paid? You're doing all this. You're, you're taking time out of your day to show me these homes and, you right. know, time away from your family. How is your compensation structured? Mm -hmm. This is the great time, and, and obviously, as I stress to all agents, at the very initial meeting, you should have your consumer notice, the buyer agency agreement, and all of the other initial documents that you can go over with them. So when, when asked that question, you pull out your buyer agency agreement and you refer to how the broker fee is paid. And it simply says, hey, in transactions where there is an offer of cooperating compensation, I will be paid X or Y dollar amount, um, as well as potentially a broker admin fee of this amount. In transactions where there is no offer of cooperating compensation or there is no listing agent potentially, I will be compensated as X or X percentage or Y dollar amount mm -hmm. plus a broker admin fee. So going over that and making sure that they understand that process is very important, but also doing it in a delicate way, I think, mm -hmm. so as not to influence them one way or another or to, to try to initiate a response of, oh, well, you know, we don't want to view these homes or we only want to view homes in that line. So I think explaining that is the very easiest way. I know many agents that I've talked to, it's kind of, you don't want to pull that document out right at the initial meeting. Maybe the parties are still getting used to one another. Um, but if asked that question, what a great opportunity to say, oh, by the way, let's go over this mm -hmm. document, which will explain how that transaction plays out. Fantastic. And also to help our agents, we should make you aware that NAR has produced some really great um, websites for you to use. The first is competition.realtor, which helps to explain. They have infographics, all videos, all sorts of great information about how the MLS works and how it helps to make a pro-consumer marketplace out there. And then they also have another website called realestatecommissionfacts.com, where it helps to explain to consumers how those commissions are paid in the real estate industry. So if you haven't had an opportunity to check out those two resources, we would highly encourage you to get on there and check that out as well. So I have another question for you. You talked a little bit about what would happen if how the buyer's agent might get paid would be outlined in the um, BAC. Correct. Um, if there was no offer of compensation. So what is your best advice over how an agent should handle that mm -hmm. when a buyer wants to view a listing and they're looking at the buyer's agent compensation, they're seeing that it's zero or potentially it's less than what they had agreed to be paid in the BAC. How should a buyer's agent handle that? Well, that's, that's a great question. And I think it's, it's, again, a matter of being delicate with the situation and to say mm -hmm. um, very, very first point, 
you, you cannot exclude any of mm -hmm. the properties. If the property fits within the buyer search criteria, you must present, you know, at least the MLS listing to say, hey, is there any interest and do you want to look at this? So um, if, and, and I will say typically, uh, it is going to be the buyer agent who's going to, you know, be the one reviewing that. They're going to be the ones who may, might notice that the there is no offer of cooperating compensation. Um, so very first off the bat, there should not be any process of elimination, so to speak, on behalf of a buyer agent or a buyer brokerage. Any criteria, any search criteria that really fits um, within that property specifications should be sent out. Make sure the buyer gets a look at that. Mm -hmm. um, second step, they decide, hey, I'd like to go see this property. I may want to write an offer. Can you give me a, an idea of what cost would look like? That is the time that you go over based on your initial closing cost estimate that mm -hmm. will show them on paper. Because there is no cooperating compensation and because of our buyer agency agreement, mm -hmm. this is the amount in addition to what you are going to pay um, if there was an offer of cooperating compensation based on that dollar amount. Um, and again, that's that. unless there's two offers they're looking at, that's just going to be on one of those closing cost estimates. Um, and that is where you can really show them, okay, this is the total amount. And if they have a question on that, that's when you can refer them back. Remember when we had the discussion of the buyer agency agreement, the, in this instance, there is no cooperating compensation uh, and therefore that's going to factor in. But that's really the way you want to hit that on the head. Um, and, and then I think if the buyer says, well, wait a minute, I really like the property, but I also don't know if I'm going to stomach that cost because that, that might push me over the limit in terms of budget. Um, there is another alternative and that is PAR has a form out there that you can ask for assistance on compensation towards an agent. Um, and, and you can say a buyer can request the seller to contribute seller assist essentially to cover the cost that they would otherwise the buyer would otherwise incur for their broker fee to pay for the buyer agent services and that's a perfectly acceptable practice and as I said before uh, PAR has that form out there I encourage everybody to review that review the guidelines um, to that form and make sure they're comfortable with the use of that form so that's an excellent point so I think it's probably I'm not speaking out of turn to say it's probably been rarely used Correct. in York and Adams counties and this might be a new form for many of you to learn. So yes, look over that compensation addendum to the agreement of sale and those guidelines of use and obviously have those conversations with your broker on how you might utilize that form as part of uh, the offers that you are putting forward for your buyers. But I think that there's probably some of our realtors right now are questioning, hey, I thought that that is a violation of NAR's code of ethics. So yes. can you explain why it's not absolutely and in what circumstances it would be right well first of all anybody who's thinking that i, I champion you and if so <laughs> make sure you are serving on our code of ethics or professional standards because that we will dive deep into this so um you are correct there is a, an article 16 and there's a standard of practice mm -hmm. it's 16-16 i believe uh that basically says that um a, a broker as part of an offer cannot make an offer contingent upon any change or anything based on what they put in the MLS in terms of offering cooperating compensation. So this is now again, it's those classic attorneys, right? Um, the nuance is it in that case, what they are prohibiting is a buyer brokerage asking a listing brokerage mm -hmm. to share or alter what has been offered in terms of cooperating compensation and making an offer contingent upon that listing brokerage accepting that, that is where that violation could occur. Now remember, it's not a violation of the standard of practice, but it would be a violation of Article 16. Um, in this instance, like I said before, the, the, the big difference, it's a buyer mm -hmm. asking the seller to help pay for the buyer agent services, not a buyer agent asking the listing agent to share what the seller is already paying to the listing agent. So in that instance, um, although it is a nuance, that is the difference and that's why it is, is permissible to, to utilize that. There is, I will say, almost kind of remiss, there is a form for the broker to ask the, the other mm -hmm. agent, the listing broker, for that cooperating compensation. But if you look at um, PAR's guidelines on that form, it is very strict. Make sure you're getting counsel before you do that and there is a mm -hmm. strong consideration of a violation potentially of the NAR code of ethics for doing that. So that's the difference. Um, and, and like I said before, although it, it, at first glance, it might seem like that's what you're doing. In this case, it is different. The buyer is asking the seller. The buyer agent is not asking the listing agent or the listing brokerage. Okay. Yep.
Perfect. All right, so hopefully that was as clear as mud to everybody. But again, <laughs> um, before you use any of the forms, if this is your first time using it, make sure you're tra getting some counsel from your broker, get legal counsel if necessary as well. Rayact does offer a free legal hotline through Peter Ruth at Stock and Leader, so please feel free to give Peter a call if you have any questions about how any of those forms are utilized. So any final words of advice to our members about how they're navigating this changing real estate industry? Yes, I think um, ask questions, as Sean has said. We have so many resources that are available, not just through REAC, but through PAR, through NAR. Um, pay attention. I know that's an easy one, but but I think the outcome of these lawsuits, especially in Missouri and Illinois, uh, will be uh, very indicative of how a practice may be shifting. Um, and, and remember, there's no industry standard. Discussing an industry standard or a common practice even um, in the industry is a violation of antitrust. So be very careful. And most importantly, don't voice any frustration on social media. Try to refrain from that. I know it's very um, comforting to kind of get uh, some support from other fellow realtors or even members of the public who are saying maybe, oh yeah, this is outrageous. Why would anybody do that? Uh, but remember, as agents, you're, you're held to a higher standard. Um, and, and as a result, the NAR Code of Ethics follows you everywhere you go, especially when you're posting things on social media. So just be very careful. Um, you know, if you do have frustrations, that's what the hotline is for. Give me a call. I'm happy to discuss those with you. But again, at this point in time, with all of the lawsuits and everything going on, um, you, you almost have a, a big target on everyone that they're looking for violative behavior. Uh, and the easiest way to find that is on social media. So if there are frustrations or there are, are questions, let's ferret those out. Let's get down to the bottom of those. But just be very cautious of what you're doing out there in terms of posting. Okay. All right. Great advice. Thank you for being here, Peter. We My appreciate pleasure. it as always. And if you ever have any other questions or topics you'd like me to address in this video blog, please feel free to reach out to me because my doors and ears are always open to you. Thanks so much and have a wonderful day. Thanks.